Government and Rural Affairs. And I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you. Question one. My department's assessment is that the recent wet weather in August has caused some localised flooding in parts of Kilkeel and Newcastle areas and also led to some disruption of blight control programmes and difficulties with the desiccation of potato crops across Northern Ireland. As we now move into the main period for potato harvesting, DERA staff will continue to monitor the situation as the effects of water logging on a potato crop are difficult to evaluate until a number of weeks later, usually at harvest. Furthermore, the DERA staff will continue to provide technical advisory support to Northern Ireland potato growers to maximise business performance. I thank the Minister for his answer. I believe there has also been flooding on the Ards Peninsula, but of course flooding is not a responsibility of the Minister's department. How well do you think the relevant departments are coordinating and coming together to help the growers? Well, in, in terms of it, um, thankfully we have had a couple of weeks of drier weather, and uh, for some people potato harvesting has already started. Um, there is an outstanding issue um, over a, a, an EU-imposed uh, obligation uh, that uh, material that was previously used to burn off potatoes uh, is no longer available, and that has caused considerable problems in the desiccation of the potato crops. And one of the suggestions was that if they do not desiccate properly and the, the, the stem does not separate from the potatoes, then that the farmers could actually flail the potatoes, um, uh, flail the tops. Um, however, the wet weather has a consequence for that, and it is clearly unsuitable uh, to be putting um, heavier tractors and flails uh, in to, to, to do that. that. That is not something uh, which farmers would be capable of doing. So that is a cause of significant concern. I call Gemma Dolan. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on the application for approval for an emergency use of DICWAT for 2020? Yeah, I have had um, several submissions on this. I had a conversation yesterday, and I am to receive a further submission uh, today on it. Uh, CRD is the advisory body, who, and CRD have advised um, that we should not be using it at this stage uh, for a number of reasons. It has come from the European Union in the first instance uh, that it is uh, not something which they would wish to be used any, any longer. However, the replacement, that's the, the replacement that have been recommended are not working. Therein lies the problem. So whenever farmers go to harvest their potatoes, um, it has not done the job appropriately or properly. And therefore I need to consider uh, this year as to whether I can uh, allow uh, farmers to use DICWAT um, and use that particular uh, means for burning potatoes off. And that is something which I am giving consideration to. Um, and I know that a number of other countries in Europe have already given um, exceptional uh, consideration to this and granted its use. I call Jim Allister. Same theme, Minister. Um, I would certainly encourage you to take the step on the DQUIT. Uh, Denmark, Finland, Austria have all given approval. Uh, so what is the time scale in you reaching a conclusion? Because time is now of the essence as far as potato harvesting is concerned. As has the Republic of Ireland. Um, so uh, there has been two applications made to CRD. Um, CRD have rejected both applications. Um, however, it is apparent, it is very apparent, that the materials that have been recommended are not materials which are fit for purpose in terms of doing the job that is required to be done. Um, DICWAT was not uh, removed from the market because of a danger to consumers. Uh, it is more about um, its users. Um, however, uh, I, these are all significant issues. I think that there has to be a, a, another uh, material found to replace it. And I have to take all of these matters into consideration, uh, but have asked for, for um, further updates so that I can take uh, everything into account and give a final decision on it very soon. Moving on, I call Alex Easton. Question number two, Deputy Speaker. My department is aware of the negative impact that invasive alien species can cause to the local environment with an invasive alien species strategy launched by the then DOE in 2013. Detailing actions such as targeted eradication awareness, raising uh, research and development. 
The ongoing strategy has brought together many different stakeholders, including local councils, NGOs, and other government departments and agencies, such as Department for Infrastructure, Forest Service, AFPI, and LOCKS Agency, to work towards dealing with the threat of IAS. The Invasive Alien Species Enforcement and Permitting Order in Northern Ireland 2019 came into force in December 2019, giving the Department more effective enforcement powers to take action against 66 species of European Union concern, including 11 widely spread species. The underlying EU regulation not only makes an offence to permit the spread or release of any of these species, but makes it illegal to sell, keep, import, breed or cultivate any of the 66 um, 30 animal and 36 plant species, with a special emphasis on the 11 widely spread species. There is now an expectation, as part of a national obligation, for landowners to manage and remove these 11 species from their land. The Department has commenced work, working proactively with landowners in relation to the 11 widely spread species to advise them of their responsibilities and to secure management measures from those landowners on how they plan to manage and remove these species from their land. My officials are currently following up on over 60 of these queries with a variety of landowners, including farmers, business owners, councils and other government departments and agencies. My department has also provided multi-agency plans for those high-risk species that have not yet arrived in Northern Ireland, such as the Asian Hornet, along with pathway action plans with a biosecurity focus to endeavour to close down potential routes for IAS to arrive in Northern Ireland. The Invasive Species Ireland website, managed by departmental officials, provides full guidance on confirming ID, management techniques and legislation, and the associated social media streams providing up-to-date news and information. My department continues to encourage and fund via the Environment Fund and Environmental Farming Schemes many community groups, non-governmental organisations, farmers and landowners to carry out management and removal of invasive species from the land prioritising designated and high-value biodiversity sites. I call uh, Alex Easton for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Could the Minister uh, outline what the Department is doing to help control giant hogweed? Giant hogweed was recently designated as a widely spread species. Uh, so for WSS, the regulation requires effective management measures to be put in place so their impact on biodiversity, the related ecosystem services, and where applicable in human health or economy are minimised. Management measures consist of lethal or non-lethal physical, chemical or biological actions aimed at eradication, population control and containment of a population of species of union concern. My department is therefore being proactive and following up every record of giant hogweed entered via official monitoring scheme and are requiring detailed management measures uh, to be supplied by all landowners. I call Rachel Woods. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware of the devastation and difficulties that are caused by Japanese knotweed. And so can the Minister outline whose responsibility it is to deal with and remove Japanese knotweed at NIEA sites like Redburn Country Park in my constituency? Yeah, the EU Invasive Alien Species Committee are, are the ones who are responsible for listing. Um, the species of union concern, as opposed to my department. So the EU IAS committee explained that some well-known IAS are not listed either because they do not have a risk assessment, or the risk assessments do not include some of the information required by the regulation, or there was insufficient evidence that the species met the criteria for listing. In this instance, there was insufficient evidence for them that the inclusion of Japanese knotweed on the union list would effectively prevent, minimise or mitigate its adverse impact. So as a result, the IIS committee decided that the listing would not be able to make a significant difference to a species that was already so widely spread throughout the European Union. Barton. Thank you very much for your answers so far. Uh, could you please, Minister, detail what action the Department has taken to address the invasion of the zebra mussels in our inland waterways, particularly Loch Erne? Again, um, all of these species um, are responsibilities, first and foremost, um, for those who, who have ownership of properties. The zebra mussel issue has been going on for some time, um, I understand, uh, particularly in Loch Erne. It's a big problem for the boat owners. And it's certainly something that I'll be happy to correspond further with the member on. 
Moving on, I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question three. We must be careful not to demonise all plastic. Plastic packaging has many beneficial properties, such as prolonging the life of food, which reduces harmful carbon emissions from food waste. Plastic packaging not only protects food from damage, but is also very light and significantly reduces the transport-related climate emissions of the many food items that are shipped around the UK. That said, JIRA has joined the other UK administrations in becoming a member of the UK Plastics Pact. In contributing to the pact, the Department is directly funding the work of the organisers, the Waste Resources Action Programme, to develop and disseminate approaches to reduce the environmental impact of plastic packaging. Membership of the pact also enables the Department to use its contact networks to share innovations, data, analyses, and analysis and reports with businesses. DERA's um, Colleges for Agriculture, Food and, and Enterprise uh, packaging technologists have assisted the local food and drink sector with 50 knowledge and technology transfer projects this year, as well as helping local businesses select the most appropriate packaging type for their product to optimise its quality, shelf life and cost efficiency. CAFRI's technologists also um, actively support businesses wishing to explore sustainable alternatives to plastic packaging. CAFRI is working with Northern Ireland Food and Drinks Association, uh, food and drinks processors, to facilitate uh, better engagement between the manufacturing sector and policy makers to help create an improved shared understanding of the use and potential reduction of plastic and food packaging. A further significant area of work by the Department is on the reform of the UK-wide packaging system, leading to an extended producer responsibility scheme. This places responsibility on producers for the full net cost of managing their products once the products reach their end of life. Producers will be incentivised through the introduction of modulated fees to reduce unnecessary and difficult to recycle packaging and to design and use packaging that is recyclable. I call Paul Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, I, as a shopper, am becoming increasingly aware of the overuse of single-use plastics and aluminium cans that we use every day, and I think we all have a responsibility there. And can, I just want to notice that in Scotland they are introducing a deposit return scheme by 2022. Um, can I ask you when we are likely to see something similar here in Northern Ireland? Uh, yes, th thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. My department has consulted already on the deposit return scheme, and we have asked for further evidence and analysis to inform uh, a decision on the way forward. I do want to make sure that any deposit return scheme is right for Northern Ireland, draws on the evidence and what works elsewhere in the world, and achieves our goal of reducing litter from drink containers and improving their recycling. And specific details on a scheme will be developed and presented in a second con consultation. I know there are some concerns in the industry about the DRS. Um, I have seen evidence of other ways of doing it. So, for example, um, you could have the, uh, a, 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 bar, um, a barcode put, up, put on an, an, an item, uh, which you could then de potentially deposit um, in your green bin, um, but that is going to be recycled. Uh, so there is the potential of doing it other ways and then sending the barcode in so you can reclaim uh, your deposit on it. So, it may not just be about sending all the material back to the initial manufacturer. There may be other and better ways of doing it. I call Karen Mullen. Last can call her. Minister, considering that uh, globally we dump eight million pound or eight million tonnes of plastic into our oceans each year, and um, unless we act decisively, there will be more plastic than fish in our oceans by 2050. Would the minister be willing to go a step further? And consider a total ban on all non-essential plastics. I certainly consider it, but um, I, th I think that I indicated in the first paragraph of, of, of the statement that plastics weren't exclusively bad, um, but nonetheless, we really need to reduce the amount of plastic that we're using, particularly plastic that's used from virgin materials. And secondly, we really need to ensure that that plastic is. Um, recycled um, and reused and, and doesn't end up in our oceans or indeed in, in landfill sites. So it is important that if we're going to use plastic 
and it may be in occasions that there, there isn't a better alternative. But on those occasions, we ensure that that is then used appropriately thereafter, and that is certainly isn't ending up in our oceans. I call Patsy McLoone. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for his answer. Um, could I ask the Minister the state of what he's been saying is, and thankfully through CAFRI, um, the to inform and incentivise businesses, has he considered the, the third option, which is where Ms Mullen was taking us, that is the, the any intention to enforce the reduction in the use of, of those plastics that aren't required? Absolutely, and uh, it's certainly something which we as a department will look at. In terms of what we're doing with CAFRI, um, you know, CAFRI have the most amazing uh, services there um, to businesses in terms of food development. And we are privileged to have facilities actually in the members' constituency at, uh, in Cookstown at Lockery College. And there's also a lot of work done there on packaging, and because packaging is absolutely critical, that we do it well, that we do it better, and we do it in a way which is least impact upon our environment. And that's that's a goal I think of everybody in this house. I call John Blair. Speaker, thank you. And can I thank the minister for the uh, range of information that's been provided so far? Uh, on a specific, and I, I don't think I missed this piece of information in there, can I ask um, if there is at this stage a, a date or a general time frame uh, in which we can expect to see a proposed plan to eliminate plastic pollution as promised in New Decade New Approach over eight months ago? Um, there is no data set as yet. Uh, it is a course of work that our department uh, is, is, is doing. Um, there has been you know, a considerable reduction um, in the use of, of, of single-use plastic bags, for example. Um, I need to consider as well the reusable bags, because there's a fair bit of evidence that quite a lot of people are, are not using them an awful lot more. So they may buy a reusable bag but only use it once. Um, and I need to look at all of those things and uh, take into consideration you know, upping what we're charging for the single-use plastic bag, but also uh, putting a charge on the reusable bag as well, an additional charge, uh, so that we can encourage people to, to reduce the amount of bags that they're using. That has been a big success story so far, um, and I trust that we can build upon that. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, has the Minister considered hemp? as an alternative to plastic and an opportunity for farm farmers to grow a versatile, sustainable crop now that licences are available in Northern Ireland? There's a range of products, including hemp and eucalyptus and, and other products, which, which pe people and businesses in particular are, are looking at and looking at the opportunities. Um, some of the other alternatives um, will use um, huge volumes of water, which isn't good either. Uh, some of the alternatives will be considerably heavier and therefore have a, a greater impact upon uh, the, the tra transport industry and, and take up more space and, and, and of greater weight and therefore you, you're losing efficiencies there. Um, so all of these things will be looked at. Um, I know that some of the, the larger companies are working really hard um, to ensure that they can uh, meet their environmental obligations. We will support, we will chivvy along, we will encourage and, and we will seek the force um, where necessary uh, companies to, to actually do their bit uh, to ensure that we um, produce a better environment. Can I encourage all members and the Minister to use the microphone so Hansard picks everything up and members can clearly hear them. At the commencement, I admit it to advise members that question 6 and question 9 have been withdrawn. I call Jerry Carl now. Number 4, please. Apologies, Mr. Speaker. I like to look at the person that I'm, that I'm, that I'm speaking to, but not responding to. But nonetheless, my department continually monitors the quality of air across Northern Ireland, and this issue includes monitoring pollutants such as particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide. Given the respiratory nature of COVID-19, my officials to continue to monitor air quality levels across Northern Ireland on a daily and, if necessary, necessary hourly basis, where necessary to protect public health a high air pollution alert was issued. Throughout the lockdown period, officials provided weekly updates to the DERA Departmental Operations Centre 
and to the ERA committee as required. Officials are also working with external contractors to look more closely at the trends and pollutants seen during lockdown, consider the relevant atmospheric chemistry and reactions that occur between pollutants, and assess the extent to which any changes brought about as a result of lockdown, such as an increase in home working, have had any influence in trends in air quality. My officials will continue to monitor the data collected, and I would encourage everyone to download the new Northern Ireland Air app in order to receive the most up-to-date information on the quality of air across Northern Ireland. I call Jerry Carl. Thank the Minister for his uh, answer. I hope you would agree with me that home working weights being obviously forced upon us uh, because of the pandemic is potentially hugely beneficial in dealing with transport, uh, transport and associated air pollution pr uh, problems, which kill too many in my and other constituencies every single year, especially when it comes to workers who uh, are able to uh, work from home and prefer it. Um, will the Minister commit alongside his executive colleagues to exploring the benefits of allowing workers uh, to work from home if they so wish uh, in the long term? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, what has been forced upon us in terms of people working from home um, has demonstrated uh, that there had been a much greater opportunity to work from home than, than had previously been recognised uh, before COVID-19. I, I would say this, that I think that it is important that people are got back to their work uh, where it's possible to do that safely, um, because I do think that even from government departments, um, we aren't fulfilling just as well as, as we would otherwise our, our rules um, with not having a, as many people in our offices. At the same time, I think that there are massive opportunities for people to be at home two, three, four days a week. Um, and that will obviously have significant benefits in reducing travel, reducing pressures on our roads and all of that. So, yeah, I'm totally with uh, you know, on, on people working from home, um, but it shouldn't be done to the detriment of the service that they're providing. And I think that we as government and indeed others uh, need to reflect upon that. I call Kiva Archibald. Thank you, Las Concordia. Um, and on a similar theme to, to Mr. Carl, um, obviously the, the global pandemic has been um, an international tragedy, but this one side effect has been that brief reprieve for the environment. Global carbon, carbon emissions have fallen by as much as 17 per cent at the height of lockdown. Greenhouse gas emissions predicted to be down by as much as 8 per cent over the course of the year. Um, in terms of more broadly speaking, uh, what steps are you taking as Minister in conjunction with the executive colleagues to make sure that we don't lose some of those gains that we have seen in terms of the environment as we st restart the economy? Kermit. Well, as part of my uh, Green Growth Strategy, we will look at all of the opportunities where we can support businesses and agriculture to continue to grow, but to do that in a more sustainable way. Um, so I want to see growth happening on the one side and a reduction happening on the other. So we're reducing um, the greenhouse gases, we're reducing the carbon that goes into the, the, the atmosphere, um, whilst at the same time we're allowing growth to take place. And I think that's essential for our economy. It's essential for our young people as they go out looking for jobs. We cannot be uh, going backwards and being regressive when it comes to creating opportunities for our young people uh, to actually get jobs here. Uh, so it's important that we get that growth on the one hand, uh, but we also um, seek to challenge uh, the issues around the environment on the other. So as part of the Green Growth Strategy, we will be setting up, um, I'll certainly be requesting that we set up an interministerial group which will oversee that, uh, where we'll be working um, appropriately uh, with the other departments uh, to ensure that we do have a cleaner and greener Northern Ireland going forward. That's something that we should all aspire to. I call Pat Cackney. Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Uh, I've seen firsthand my own children. Uh, they're lucky enough to be able to work at home. And I was wondering, does the Minister intend to bring in and encourage support working them home as we try to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, of course, the, the government instruction is still that, that people should work from home if they can work from home. Um, and th that, that, is, that is the case uh, for very many people um, across the province uh, that they continue to do that. Um, I, I would
be very supportive uh, of people working from home on the one hand, uh, but I also want to ensure that we get 100%. And uh, for many people that will be the case. Uh, but I do think that it's, in some areas it is a little more difficult um, if, if, if we don't have people uh, in offices. And I know that uh, certainly in some of the services that we provide, and for example, dear direct offices, uh, we need people in, in there to provide that face-to-face -face service with appropriate social distancing and all of that. And uh, that is something which is critically important going forward. Moving on, I call Rachel Woods. Um, Deputy Speaker, question five. My department is developing a comprehensive strategy to address the ammonia challenge. The draft strategy will propose a series of farm measures to reduce ammonia, conservation actions to improve the conditions of habitats, and a revised operational protocol for the assessment of air pollution effects. We intend to publish these proposals for consultation soon. Call Richard Woods for supplementary. The Minister for his answer. The Minister stated in AQW 2561722 that his department's current operational protocol for the assessment of impacts of ammonia emissions was based on best practice guidelines rather than specific legal advice. Is the Minister confident that the policy in question and his instruction to shared environmental services on how to assess ammonia from any potential development are indeed lawful under EU Habitats Directive? I believe they are, yes, and particularly in light of the fact uh, that we are working extremely hard uh, to bring forward proposals uh, which will, in actual fact, reduce ammonia. SES um, were arriving at decisions where, in instances where ammonia could actually be reduced because a new building was replacing an older building, uh, were better practices were in place, um, they were actually refusing those. Entirely illogical, because you were getting an investment uh, into a business, you were reducing the, 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 the mm -hmm. ammonia that was coming out of that business, and they were still getting a refusal. So that type of thing has, has, has to be knocked on the head. We are working to ensure that over the course of the next number of years we will see real reduction in ammonia. So why continue with a planning uh, procedure which isn't working whenever you have the opportunity of actually putting in place something that will actually work? And I would have thought that the member from the Green Party would want to ensure that we have a better environment and would be supportive of what we are doing in this, this instance because we are working uh, to ensure that we do get a significant reduction in ammonia. I should add one other thing. Uh, the reference to our peatlands and our bogs, a bigger issue than ammonia in our bogs is the dryness on many occasions of our bogs. And the wetting of peatlands would actually achieve more in terms of capturing carbon um, than what was being proposed on, on, on ammonia, or what was being done on ammonia, um, and even what we would do on ammonia. Um, so therefore, there has to be a series of, of tools used in terms of reducing the uh, carbon footprint and protecting uh, our environment. I call Declan McAleer. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his response. Um, the Minister will be aware that any proposal that be brought forward to reduce ammonia could have a disproportionate impact on the smaller health farmers. As the Department begins to assess the impact of any proposals, has he any mitigations in mind to avoid any disproportionate impact on those small farmers? Thank you. Well, it's something that I'm happy to work with um, you know, the, the, the farming community and with other parties on is how we take this forward. Um, because doing nothing is not an option. Um, we do need to reduce the amount of ammonia uh, that is currently going into the environment in Northern Ireland. And we also want to encourage people to be able to have a business which, which, which will support families. Uh, so I, I believe that both is achievable. Uh, and I will work with the, the Hill farming community and, and other members of the community in, in delivering on that. I call Justin McNulty for a quick question. Gourmet, I would ask Concorla. Minister, the curlew, we had 5,000 breeding pairs of the curlew in the 80s. Now we have 130. That's a 97% reduction. 
And there are other species, many other species, which are threatened. And ammonia production, the disproportionately high level of ammonia production on this part of the island, on this part of these islands, um, is impacting the environment very adversely. Given the destructive impact of ammonia on the environment, and given the threat that it, has provide, it presents to many, many species, what innovations are your department exploring to ensure that this destructive agricultural byproduct is being utilised in an environmentally safe way? And I know that reduction is probably less hard. I had asked for a brief question, or we'll have a very brief answer. I'll ask the member to finish his question. Reduction is less hard than, than utilising a different approach. I would encourage the member to, to visit Glenwary Hill Farm, where there has been a massive increase of curlew and, and the other hen harriers, the snipe, and, and all of the other species. And that has been done on the basis of good management. And I would like to see that spread out right across Northern Ireland. And that is the end of our period for list questions. And we now turn to topical questions. And I call Sinead Innes. Deputy Speaker. Um, is the Minister committed to implementing the elements of the protocol to ensure his department is operationally prepared at the end of the transition period in relation to SPS checks at points of entry? And will the designated points of entry meet EU specifications? Well, I think it would be a good question. Is, is everybody um, prepared to do that? Uh, because at this stage, one of the issues that is outstanding uh, relates to IT. And there seems to be a uh, a bit of an issue between an IT system that has been used in the UK uh, for many years uh, and EU's non-acceptance of it, which will almost certainly ensure that we are not operationally ready. Um, so there's quite a number of issues uh, where that is uh, alive and a problem. I call Sinead Ennis. Uh, thank you. Minister, I'm sure you'll be aware that Warren Point Port uh, currently resides very close to an ASSI. Uh, can the Minister give assurances that any um, point of entry uh, infrastructure at Warren Point Port won't impede on the uh, ASSI? Well, it's not a matter that, that I, I'm taking forward. Um, that is a matter that the uh, SRO uh, is looking after. Um, I don't wish to see any uh, further developments at Warren Point Port for, for points of entry. I've made that clear to um, both George Eustace uh, and others. Um, however, uh, the UK government uh, wish to see it, uh, they want to pay for it, and uh, they have uh, given very clear expectations um, to the senior civil servant, in this case, um, who is taking it forward. And uh, that is the case. I have no legal remit to stop it, um, in that all of the advice that has came from both the, the DSO and, indeed, uh, the advice that has came from the Attorney General uh, would indicate that a ministerial direction um, to an official, uh, which would oblige an official uh, to break the law, is not a ministerial direction which would have any standing. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the devastating biodiversity loss arising from ammonia pollution levels exceeding critical nitrogen thresholds across our special areas of conservation and protected habitats. So can the Minister detail how his department is working to prevent any further ecological damage and reverse the declines evident in our native species? Yes, we can. And I would like it to be a wide and uh, potentially all-embracing um, means of addressing these issues and ammonia is a, is a key part of it. Uh, so we believe that we can reduce ammonia emissions, for example, by um, stopping slurry spreading in most instances by 2025 uh, from the traditional splash plate um, to the low emission spreading uh, operation. Uh, that is something which um, we have given some, some uh, time for, for people to, to acquire the appropriate um, Equipment, and that's a, that's a course of work that will help. Um, covering open tanks is another uh, thing that would reduce the amount of ammonia. And then, of course, um, there are opportunities to have more separation of, of slurry because it is when um, the urine and the faeces mix um, that you get the greatest release uh, of the ammonia. So if we can have more separation in terms of the slots and so forth that are provided uh, where animals lie, um, then those are ver a, a range of, of courses of work which will actually proactively reduce ammonia. We can probably get 15-20% um, quite quickly, which is significant in and of itself. 
Uh, but to get much further than that um, will require significant investment. I don't believe that, that the capacity to make that investment exists within agriculture, and it will therefore require support from the government if we're serious about this. So I, I have asked my officials to, to bring forward proposals which would look at how we can actually get to, to um, net zero in, in, in agriculture, uh, and that will also include how we can actually deal with the ammonia issue at the same time. And that will involve a capital infrastructure programme, uh, which will mean uh, we as an executive will need to support that financially. I call Rachel Woods for supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his answer. The fact that 86% of our special areas of conservation now exceed critical nitrogen levels by over 200% and in some cases by over 300% raises serious questions about how this was allowed to happen. So can the Minister outline what failures in monitoring and enforcement have been identified by his department and how these will be addressed? I think that Northern Ireland has saw a lot of growth in agriculture over the period. And you must remember that for a country you know, as small as Northern Ireland, um, it produces around 10 per cent of the food um, for the needs of the United Kingdom. Uh, so we are punching well above our weight in terms of agriculture. Um, I believe that we can also punch above our weight in agriculture in terms of how we do it um, in, in an environmentally responsible way. And that is something which I believe that we can work with the farming community on. Um, I think if you, if you go into a circumstance and start directing people as to what they should be doing, um, you generally don't get the best response. But where you go in with the spirit of cooperation, uh, where you can assist where you can, where you can help where you can, you will deliver real results. And that's what I'm about, results. And I believe that we can uh, make a really big impact um, for the good um, on a lot of the reductions, not just in agriculture, I have to say. I believe that we can really do a lot um, in becoming carbon, carbon neutral over the course of the next 20 or 30 years in Northern Ireland. Um, for example, we are currently at over 40 per cent on renewable energy, way ahead of any other part um, of, of the UK. And I believe that we can go much further than that. And if you want to make real big savings in terms of environmental benefits, Agriculture, energy that we use, transportation are the three key areas. I believe that we can tackle them in all three areas and make this one of the greenest places to live anywhere in the world over the course of the next generation. I call Alan Chambers. Deputy Speaker, uh, would the Minister agree that the comments of the Member of Parliament for South Down, Mr Chris Hazard, regarding the World War II ordinance uh, that were accidentally picked up by a trawler based in our glass were at best unhelpful, and that we appreciate the bravery and skill of our Army bomb disposal teams who dealt with the incident, and indeed who during the years of the trouble and beyond had to deal with many unexploded and volatile devices left under cars, roadside ditches, and in close proximity to schools by people like those I understand the MP's office is named after. Um, thank the member for the question. Uh, I would have suggest it was more embarrassing than anything uh, for the Member of Parliament for South Down to come out with a statement that he did, um, given that I believe the ordinances um, did date back to, to the Second World War. And uh, we should have been glad of anybody who was prepared to actually go and, and risk their lives um, to, to make those ordinances safe. And I should also say that I was greatly appreciative of the people who served in the Second World War, um, such as um, Captain and now Sir Tom, um, who has demonstrated to us, you know, bravery back then, um, but have also demonstrated to us bravery now and resilience now, in terms of um, their response to COVID-19, and perhaps the member for South Down could learn something from someone uh, who served in the British Army, like Captain Tom. Can I again encourage the minister to use the microphone so that everyone can hear clearly? I call Alan Chambers for supplementary. For his response. I now call Alex Easton. Um, can I ask the Minister for his assessment on the role upland areas and the role they can play in building biodiversity? 
Well, the rural uplands um, have many opportunities, and obviously we have a lot of blanket bog in Northern Ireland, which uh, is something which captures vast amounts of carbon. Uh, sometimes that blanket bog has been undermined by, for example, inappropriate tree planting, um, and the trees have, have, uh, have absorbed a lot of the water, which would have ended up in the bog. And the drier the bogs are, um, the, the more carbon is actually released from the bog, and the less carbon is captured. Uh, so that is, is something that we are currently looking at. Um, but I have to say this, that for those farms where they have actually reclaimed land in around bogs and have been benefiting from that, if that land is going to end up being wetter and, and therefore not as usable, um, then we need to identify that we compensate those farmers um, so that we can ensure uh, that the carbon capture can take place, uh, but it doesn't one individual or, or a, a number of individuals um, who, who take the pain of actually doing that um, through loss to their business. I call Alex Easton for supplementary. Thank you. Um, could I say thank you for the Minister for his answer so far. What success has been achieved at Glenweary Hill Farm in terms of biodiversity? Glenwary Hill Farm is very exciting in terms of straightforward good management practice. Um, so we have seen uh, the reintroduction of many of many species, um, such as hen harrier, um, snipe, curlew, uh, and many other uh, uh, red grouse, uh, many other species uh, of indigenous birds, uh, which had been lost um, or was way down um, to Northern Ireland. In fact, we had a golden eagle over recently um, at Glenwarray. And the agricultural practice uh, is, is done in a way which um, still delivers, for example, growth rates of 1.2 kilos um, per day for, for, for each suckled calf on the farm, um, whilst at the same time um, delivering huge benefits environmentally. So it's how we can develop and, and you know, use that skill base um, on facilities like that um, and apply that to other farms so that they can maximise uh, what can be achieved environmentally um, whilst at the same time maximising what they can achieve um, from an agricultural perspective as well in terms of producing good quality food. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of an apparent boom in puppy sales during the coronavirus pandemic? Well, unfortunately, um, the issue of puppy farming uh, hasn't gone away, and that, 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 that is an area, and I know it, uh, I think the, the member and a number of members have asked questions about the export of pups, even through our ports here in Northern Ireland. You know, people, people, people produce pups, uh, and uh, many people are doing that in a very sustainable way and appropriately. And they love their dogs, and, and there's a, a litter or two produced from from from, from, from that do, that female dog each uh, in its lifetime, and, and they sell those pups, and that's entirely reasonable. Uh, but there's others who are exploiting dogs and selling them to people um, who don't realise that they are buying something which has come from a puppy farm. And I do think that more needs to be done. And I think that there's uh, a number of departments that could be involved in this, as well as local government, in terms of ensuring that animal welfare uh, is, is a high priority. And therefore, the welfare of dogs and pups um, is something that we actually make a priority. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the Minister's commitment to animal welfare. Does the Minister acknowledge concerns that an apparent boom in puppy sales could see an increase in abandoned puppies? And if so, what steps is he taking to encourage responsible puppy sales and to support animal welfare shelters? Well, in terms of it, um, we have a, a range of, of departments indeed. And local government has a very significant role to play when it comes to um, dogs and, and the registration of dogs and uh, indeed the license and all of that and it is absolutely critical that each of the departments that have a role um, plays a role in ensuring that we identify any issues and address those issues and certainly 
we do have issues in, in people who are producing pups in um, less than desirable conditions. And where that is brought to our attention in the veterinary sciences end, um, our vets will, 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 will actually deal with that. They will follow up and will ensure that animals are kept in conditions uh, which are uh, welfare friendly. And that is a commitment that I will give that our veterinary division uh, will follow up any complaints um, that are any, uh, where their attention is drawn in any way uh, to animals which are being kept in less than appropriate conditions. And that is the end of our period of time of questions to the Minister. Uh, I'll ask members to take their ease for a few moments.